Thank you for coming. Thank you for logging in. And thank you for allowing me the honor to share this stage with such wonderful speakers. I'm gonna talk about liberty and prosperity today in the confines of this circle, in English, and in under 18 minutes. We'll see if Jack Bauer can do that. But let me start by allowing myself the liberty to quote one of my favorite citations and definitions of liberty from the great Cervantes, who did this great book called Don Quixote de la Mancha. This is Don Quixote speaking to Sancho Panza. Liberty is one of the most precious gifts which heaven has bestowed on man. With it, we cannot compare the treasures which the earth contains or the sea conceals. For liberty, as for honor, we can and ought to risk our lives. And on the other hand, captivity is the greatest evil that can fall on man. This was written 400 years ago, but it is as actual at that time as it is today. Because whether you believe it or not, there's about 2.3 billion people in this world who are living under a regime considered not free. But there's good news. Take a look at these graphs. This is a graph that was made based on data from a, an institution called the Freedom House. It's available, obviously, in the internet. And what we can see is the behavior of the last 35 years of an index that they have been compiling over those years. Look at this. 22% of the countries in 1973 were considered free. One out of every five countries were free just 35 years ago, not even a generation. 45 were considered partially free, and one third were not free. So if you were a Martian coming to the earth, you had a one in three chance of landing in a place where there was no liberty. Population. 34% of the population of the Earth in 1973 was considered free, 23 partially free, and 44% was considered not free. 1.3 billion of free people, 1.7 billion of not free people. There were more people not free than free. Fast forward 35 years. A whopping, almost double, of the countries that are free. We still have 34% partially free, but there is a significant 10-point drop in the countries that are not free. Something happened along the way of those 35 years that liberty has prevailed over tyranny. How about the people? Well. I can tell you that for the first time in human history, there's more people living under free regime, 2.9 billion, but there's still 2.3 who are not free. By the way, if you're wondering, Guatemala is over here. So we still have a lot of work to do. But the good news is that there's freer people, freer world that hasn't come free. Many people have paid, even with their lives, for that gift that Cervantes wrote about 400 years ago. So this is the good news. Take another look at it. This is an index compiled by the Cato Institute, and it's called the Economic Freedom of the World Index. It measures, as the name says, economic freedom. And uh, it is interesting because there's not a one single uh, definition of freedom, but co they compile five gross variables to define how free different countries and different citizens of those countries are. If the government is too big, it may be choking freedom. So the smaller the government, the better. If there are, 
if the government is functioning to preserve the security, the property, and the life of their citizens, it means it's working okay. So there's economic freedom. If the citizens have access to sound money, meaning that they can perform their transactions with a minimum security that the purchasing power of the money is gonna be there, means that it's good for economic liberty. Freedom of trade, basic freedom to exchange internationally. If the government doesn't put many blockades to the commerce, that qualifies good as well. Regulation, can we open these wonderful companies that we've been telling them? Can we perform in the market with the, with the security that the government is going to enforce the contract and is not gonna block them? Regulation is important for labor, for credit, for business. Good news, we've been doing better over the last 30 years. Since 2008, 102 countries that have been part of this index report a 20% improvement in economic liberty. There's a correlation between the Freedom House and the Cato Institute numbers. So, what does this mean? Does liberty pay off? Do the people that live in free countries versus not free countries experience a difference? Let me show you the data as it has been compiled. Economic freedom has uh, been measured dividing the countries into four what they call quartiles. Groups of 25% of countries that belong to most free, second most free, third most free, and least free. People that live in most free countries have a, a gross domestic product per capita, the production of the goods and services in a year, they produce about $32,000 per year per person on average. That means that if you land in this countries, you will be likely to be eight and a half times richer than if you live in a country least free. No wonder many people want to go to the United States. You can make only $3,800 in a country classified at least free. The good news is that if you move along this line, if you start improving on legal requirements in your country, if you open your economy, and if you secure the property rights and follow up that list that I just showed you, there's hope. You can move along from three to 7,000 to 14,000, all the way up to 32,000. Liberty pays off. It means that even the poorest citizens in these countries have hope. What the study finds is that if you take the income of the poorest 10% of that 102 country sample, you will see that the most free countries, the poor people of that free, most free country can earn about $8,000 per person on average per year. Compare that to $900 in the least free countries. So you can make about nine times more no wonder there's immigration, because people in these countries, they'd rather be poor in the United States or any other country considered least free or most free than in a poor country considered least free. So this is not a recipe, but there's a lot of room of what we can do to, cons to start harvesting the benefits of liberty, of economic liberty as the Cato Institute has defined. Liberty also has another quality. It creates a virtuous circle. If you measure not only economic liberty, but other liberties in these countries, such as political rights, civil liberties, you will find, according to this index, which means the lower, the better, that most free countries also experience 
the benefits of other uh, freedoms, such as democracy, the right to vote, to fair and free elections. Whereas these three countries, not surprisingly, offer an environment in which liberty and other liberties are not respected either. Look at this graph. This is my favorite graph. I call it freedom has a spillover effect benefits graph. Clearly, most of the world has moved in the right liberty direction. But what I like to see from this graph, which is a, a, a creation of the United Nations Development Program, is that the freer the world, the freer the world. This is what they call the Human Development Index. It's a combination of the education of the people, the income per person, and the life expectancy. The closer this index gets to one, the better, the better quality of life as measured by those three variables. So even though we have seen throughout these uh, graphs that not all countries have moved from free to not free or from free to least free, what we see is that almost all of them have moved in the same direction, meaning that almost all of them, one of the, each one of these lines is a country, almost all of them have an upward slope in direction. You can see some exceptions, but these are mostly countries torn by war. So obviously there's not much freedom in the war. But even countries that are not free had benefit from the development, the invention, and the creativity of countries, of citizens of countries that are free. The internet is all over the world, regardless of the qualification of the country, whether it is free, partially free, or le least free. So look at China, which is right now considered a not free country. It's certainly a little bit of economic liberty in that country has paid off a lot in terms of human development. So indeed, liberty, although a gift that not everyone in the world has, pays off. So is there a catch in this history? Is there something wrong in this picture? Indeed, it may be. Like Jefferson is said to say, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Many people have walked this road of liberty over the last 35 years, or for that matter, over the course of human history. And many of them have made huge sacrifices. Right now, it, it's kind of funny, but the threat, the biggest threat to liberty could be the biggest advantage to preserving our liberty. Let me explain. You saw that index of economic freedom. It has size of government. It has the quality of the laws, the quality of the regulations. That service is provided by the government. But the, the one that is supposed to protect our liberty could be also the one that will take it away from us. Who do you think the population in the Middle East is trying to get their liberty from? The so-called Arab Spring. They are trying to recuperate their liberty from their government. Remember what uh, Cervantes said, liberty is one of the most precious gifts which heaven has bestowed on man, not which government has bestowed on man. We need a government to protect our liberties, not to threaten them. So in this eternal struggle of liberty, we find out that the eternal vigilance may be eternal vigilance against the only one institution that can legally, although not legitimately, take that liberty away from us. Who would have thought only five years ago, not 35 years ago, five years ago, who would have thought that pigs would be something else than a good source of bacon? I mean, pigs, as in the term Portugal, Ireland, Greece, Spain, 
as countries that are classified under almost in the brink of default, in the brink of economic chaos. Add to that Italy, who according to this portrait of The Economist is really on the edge right now. Who would have thought that spending wealth that you do not have and passing the bill to the next generation in the form of a huge public debt would be economic havoc? Who would have thought only five years ago that this would be a drawing that represents the US citizen, changed to a, the greatest bill in history? Who would have thought that Standard & Poor's, the rating agency, would downgrade the debt of the United States? Hey, I teach a course in finance and the books is full with something called risk-free rate. Turns out that we're gonna to have to rewrite those books again because now there is no such a thing as risk-free anymore. See what happens when government officials spend the money that you haven't created yet, yet they can pass the bill to you, your sons and daughters, or your next generations. So there is a reality check now. Who would have thought only five years ago that we could see this map of America turned upside down. There's a famous singer in Guatemala called Ricardo Arjona. He has a song, If the North Were the South, where the song is real now. After learning over the 70s and the 80s of the mismanagement that government did on our debt, our finances, now the North looks like the South and the South looks like the North. Those who do not learn from the mistakes of the past are doomed to repeat them. So as I encourage you to take the next 35 years and to grab your liberty with your hands and to create new and exciting enterprises and to read as many books as you can and not let anyone tell you what to read or what not to read, I also encourage you to watch that pilot that we were told this morning. That pilot is your government. And you have to have the courage to tell them to pull that lever before it's too late. Because you are the co-pilot and the citizen who is willing and able to take your country to a better place. And don't let anyone run amok your public finances, your liberties, and your life. Thank you, and have a good day.